presentation on uh, this Versa Elegance 821 2007 model. Uh, the Elegance is the top of the Versa range, the 821, their flagship uh, A class tag axle rear fixed bed with a garage. My name is Chris Baynard, the company is Elite Motorhomes, and let's take you through this vehicle. So, the uh, Fiat key would suggest that there is central bottom on this vehicle. A-Class, although it's a Fiat chassis, Fiat engine underneath, this a air cab is actually built by Bursna and it doesn't have central locking functionality. So each of the doors, both the cab doors and the habitation door, are all accessed with your Bursna habitation key. The bonnet release is going to be quite difficult to show you on camera, but if I step in here, the bonnet release is actually hidden around the side here and there's just about enough room to get your hand in so just for your reference um, i don't know how well you can see it but just in front of the passenger seat there is a rectangular plastic hatch and your engine battery is located under there now that might be considered quite inconvenient if you ever want to jump start or charge your engine battery to lift all of that floor up to do so uh, might be an inconvenience. So what they give you is a positive and a negative terminal under the bonnet uh, to save you lifting all that floor up. So if you just follow me around here, the bonnet, if you can lift it up, has like this cantilever action on these A-Class motorhomes. Might be quite difficult to see. You'll notice the engine, well it's more the front actually, is built over the top of the engine. So there's limited space in there. It's quite difficult to see. Hopefully it comes out on the video, but uh, just above the fuse box or to the left of the fuse box cover here there is a little flap which you lift up and just where that metal tag is there that exposes your positive terminal so that's where your red crocodile clip will clip onto. Your negative is only over an earth point so you just need to find a chunky bit of metal and again probably quite difficult to see but just to the right of the engine block there is uh, an engine mount and that's a really good solid earth there which doesn't rust where you can put it all negative onto. Okay, you will have all the usual bits and pieces in here, um, oil fill and dipstick just tucked right down here. You have your coolant here, uh, your washer fluid is here, they give you a, a, they've made a spout just so it makes it that bit easier to fill your washer fluid. Okay, we can pop back round door. Um, now, again, particularly difficult uh, to see under the seat, so I'll just explain. The Elegances are a, uh, or the Elegance 821 is a fully winterised vehicle. They uh, have a double skin floor, both the fresh and the grey tanker inside, but also what they build into their flagship model you have a heat exchanger and it works both ways so when the engine is running you have a pump inside which I'll, sh I'll show you when we get to uh, or a switch for the pump inside sorry which I'll show you the location of that when we get to the internals with that pump turned on and the engine running the heat exchanger will actually warm the water in the Aldi wet system in the radiators and it will heat the living compartment whilst the engine's running if you want it to do so but also, on the reverse, when you are, uh, for example, an ideal vehicle, uh, vehicle for going skiing in the Alps with, you have sub-zero conditions. Diesel does actually freeze, uh, although lots of the modern petrol stations in the Alps now have additives in the diesel to help prevent that. Um, but this is a 2007 vehicle, 13 years ago. Um, uh, an issue they identified was that the diesel would actually freeze, so you couldn't start your engine. So with the uh, heating system, the Audi system running inside, and again this pump turned on, the heat exchanger works in the, in, the, in the reverse where it will actually warm the, pre-warm the engine and also around the diesel tank to try and help prevent the diesel from freezing. So part of that system is actually under your passenger seat. The other part, not that you need to do anything, but just so you know where the location is, the pump is here for your heat exchanger. Uh, but like I say, the switch for that is located inside in the kitchen area. Because of the double skin floor, we have storage all the way across to the other side. Loads of 
and loads of storage in this personal model along with your garage at the back in here you have uh, it might look a bit of a mess but this is your what's called your e-box this is effectively the brain of the motorhome all of the 12 volts run through your e-box you have uh, all of your 12 volt blade fuses they are labeled but they're labeled in German uh, so I suppose it's a Google translate job for that uh, or of course your operating handbook will in fact tell you what each of the fuses do just behind the door you have the fill for your diesel please do not get that confused with just a bit further along the fill for your fresh water this does say Wasser on it which is obviously the German for water however it's black in colour same as your diesel and uh, we have had customers previously that have got these mixed up so it's just really important that you obviously don't get them muddled up uh, fill for your diesel is of course pretty self-explanatory. Fill for your fresh water is nice and simple. You put your hose pipe into the side here. Uh, if you want to fill the tank, then just keep going until it's full. Basically, there's an overflow, um, and you'll see water running out underneath the vehicle through the overflow. Alternatively, there is a digital gauge inside which will tell you the level of your fresh water. along here we have an outlet for an external shower and your hose will click into here the pump the water pump inside of course has to be turned on for this to work your mains hookup point is here uh, to remove the cable there's a blue plunger that you've got to push down and then that will make the, the, the cable easier to pull out. The cable you cannot get round the wrong way. One end plugs into the van and one end plugs into the campsite and it's a male and female connector so you can't get them the wrong way around. Just to touch very briefly on 12 and 230 volt systems, on this particular motorhome you have two leisure batteries. Both, each of them are 12 volt but they are connected in parallel so provides 12 volts to the motorhome, the habitation or the living side of things. All of your lights, your water pump on board are 12 volt. Your heating is gas or mains. Your fridge is gas or mains or 12 volt. So if you want to free camp, you want to park in the middle of a field where mains hookup is not available to you, you can do so. The TVs on board this particular vehicle are 12 volt as well. So you can actually run the majority of your appliances. However, if you want to run a mains appliance, then you have got to hook the vehicle up to mains. A mains appliance will have a three pin plug on the end of it. So microwave, hair dryer, phone charger. If it's got a three pin plug on the end of it, then you will require mains to power that device. To touch briefly on charging, when the engine is running, you have a split charger on the alternator which will charge all three batteries, so your engine battery and your two leisure batteries at the same time. With the Versner, uh, they fit the e-box, and so the mains charging will charge the, will, will give a high amperage charge to the leisure batteries, but there will also be a two amp trickle charge on the vehicle battery, the engine battery as well. The mains charging, floating charger so you won't overcharge the batteries when they're full uh, the, the charger will just stop basically and as the voltage drops or the, the uh, amp hours drop in the battery the charger will kick in and top the batteries back up again just to the right of the mains hookup port you have your Aldi gas vent uh, you don't need to do anything with this, there's no cover for it, uh, you just say so you know what it is. This, is. this is where all the exhaust gas, the burnt gas, comes, uh, comes out of. Another nice feature that they put on the, uh, on the Elegance 821, you have a, a big garage door, but it's the same size on both sides of the the other side of the vehicle. And uh, I'll just take you around that side because we have things like the drain for the great water and uh, all the things like that around. This particular vehicle's had a tow bar fitted by a previous owner. 
there's a, a few valves to show you in here. So you have the main on off valve for your grey water and there are also a couple of drain points for winterisation. If we just focus on the grey water tank, it's worth stressing, um, again motor homeowners will already know this but for first timers, your grey water tank is absolutely nothing to do with your toilets, uh, sewage or waste whatsoever. That all goes into a cassette which is further down the vehicle. Your grey water is basically all the water that goes down a plug hole from your shower to your kitchen sink to your bathroom sink. That all goes down into a, a grey water holding tank. Now when you're on your campsite on your pitch the etiquette is of course to have the valve closed off so that you collect all of the water in the in the grey water tank. The majority of proper campsites will have a drainage area. It looks a bit a little bit like a cattle grid that you drive over and then you can dump your grey water. The pipe where the grey water comes out of is just is just here where my hand is. But the valve to open and close the grey water tank and it may not come up that well on the video but you can actually see your grey tank here. That's the holding tank. The valve is currently 90 degrees to the flow of the pipe which means that it is closed and to open it you just turn the valve in line with the pipe. I'm just going to let this grey water just come out onto the ground here. You shouldn't really do that but I know that this has only had fresh water in it. This is just, uh, we've just put a bit of water in to test for the, for the workshop, ready for the next customer. You may have noticed there are two coloured pipes, um, both with a yellow tag on each one. If we lift this tag up on the red pipe, that will drain the water out of the water heater. And on the blue pipe, that will drain the fresh water at the lowest point in the vehicle. I'm going to come back to those later on in the handover, but just make a mental note of where they are because at some point we'll have to discuss winterisation and draining your vehicle down. Okay, so the previous owner of this motorhome has had what is quite an expensive awning fitted with sides um, normally associated with race meets, race teams. Uh, it's, a, it's a very robust, strong awning, very sensible feet for stability. Uh, I'm just going to show you the shade side of this awning. Just one thing to note, there are two hexagonal uh, nuts with an internal thread and they just locate here and here. I've, I've already pre-removed those just for ease uh, for this video really, but when finished with the awning these do need to be threaded back in uh, for security for the awning casing for when you're travelling. So. I'm just going to show you the sun canopy side of the awning. I'm not going to get all the sides out. It's very involved. It takes quite a lot of time to put all the enclosure together. If, uh, you were just going to uh, use what I call the sun canopy. It really is for exactly that, just purely for shade cover. If you put all the sides on, then of course it makes it more weatherproof. Um, but if you're just going to use it as I'm about to show you, then uh, the shade cover only. I wouldn't leave it out in heavy rain and I wouldn't leave it out in heavy winds. And we're just going to wind the awning out. I'll probably get it to about here so you can access these holes because you will notice that in the garage there are feet legs uh, just tucked uh, just down the back here in the garage area you've got these feet with these pins which locate into these holes to support the weight of the cylinder. that's pretty self-explanatory um, so I'll wind the awning back there's not too much uh, too much need to show you that I don't think. and also when the awning's fully in don't forget of course to screw those two nuts in just to, uh, just to keep the awning casing secure for travelling. Just behind the offside rear garage door, we have this small rectangular locker, and inside here you've got your Thetford toilet cassette. As previously mentioned, the toilet waste will go into the cassette and into the cassette only. Um, I've just unlocked the latch. Just 
or something worth noting, to get the cassette out, you must lift that yellow catch up first, and the cassette should easily slide out. If it doesn't easily slide out, if there is a bit of resistance there, then the likely cause is that the release flap on the inside has been left open. And that will then, that will then stop you uh, getting the cassette out, unless of course you force it out, which will then in turn damage the plastic. So if there is any resistance, just stop, take a couple of seconds, think about it. It's likely that that flap is open on the inside. Uh, another thing worth noting, the toilet flush takes a direct feed from the fresh water tank. So it does not have a separate reservoir. So for those of you that are used to the aqua chem rinse, the pink chemical, you can completely forget it uh, uh, because the, 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 there is no reservoir for the toilet flush. You will just be focusing on the blue or the organic green which goes in the cassette uh, only. So you would take your cassette over to the disposal area on your campsite. You can also empty these down a the toilet if you need to do so at home. To empty the cassette, this arm swings around, you undo this cap. When you are tipping, quite important, you remember to hold that button down. That releases the vacuum and allows air into the toilet cassette. When the cassette is completely empty, put a bit of fresh water down the spout, swill it, tip it again. I'd probably repeat this a couple of times just for cleanliness. And then what you want to do is measure out a capful of your blue or green chemical, tip that down the spout, and that is your cassette then charged and ready to go. Some people mix it with a bit of fresh water, you can do so. I personally don't see the need to do so, but you can do that if you wish to do so. Put all, the, uh, all of this back and you just make sure that this flap is, is the correct way around and both of these arrows line up. You've charged your cassette with the, uh, with the blue or the green toilet chemical. You're now ready to put it back in and it should just simply slide back in and you get a positive click as the, uh, as the cassette uh, locates into place. And that's all there is to it. You'll notice just a bit further along we have another external shower point. Uh, presumably for some reason the previous owner wanted one on, on either side. So, uh, to run an external shower on either side of the vehicle. Rectangular vents, these are the gas vents for your fridge. Just here, quite a nice feature. You have a gas barbecue point and there is a small silver key to unlock it. You have your barbecue point here and your on off valve here. And this is all regulated at your gas locker. So you don't need to carry a separate regulator, which your barbecue might have come with. Uh, you can simply connect direct into the side of the vehicle here. Okay. In this locker, you will have your leisure batteries. These are uh, or what look like fairly new leisure batteries. They're banner, they're 100 amp hour. When we at Elite sell a second-hand vehicle, we do what's called a drop test, which is a machine which clips onto the batteries. We do, what we do a drop test on the engine battery and also on the leisure batteries. If they fail the drop test, then we just put new batteries on. But if they pass the drop test, then they are of good quality, they are retaining the charge, and we will leave them on. Batteries do have a life, they don't last forever, and very simply, the better you look after your batteries, the longer they will last. Things that damage batteries are if you let the voltage go absolutely dead flat. For example, you park your vehicle up for six months and, and, and don't, don't maintain the batteries at all. You can go to the vehicle and invariably the engine battery will be flat. And also probably the leisure batteries as well. Although everything might be turned off, there is always a small drain with digital panels and things on your engine and your leisure battery. So you really want to keep on top of keeping them charged up. The better you can keep them charged up, the longer they'll last for. Uh, we've talked about charging already. If you want to leave your vehicle permanently hooked up to mains, you can do so. Previously mentioned, it is a floating charger, so it won't overcharge or cook the batteries. Okay. Just to the right of the battery locker, we have the gas locker. 
We have space in here, two gas bottles. This is all ready to go for our customer. So these are orange, which means they are propane. They're six kilo calories, which can be exchanged to any Cala agent. It's worth noting that Cala is only in the UK. So if you go to France or Germany, you want to make sure your bottles are, are full if you're going for a fairly long period of time before you leave, because you won't be able to exchange these bottles. To change the bottles, this round makes it a bit easier for you to see. You close this circular valve off on the top. It's clockwise to close it. You would then put your spanner onto this brass nut, but it's just worth noting that the this is a left-hand thread, which means that uh, it's the wrong way around, basically. You turn it clockwise to undo it and anti-clockwise to do it up. So it's not lefty loosey righty tighty it's the wrong way around. When you're driving along, we advise that you turn the gas off. For the purpose of the handover though, I'm going to leave the gas bottle on so I can fire everything up off gas and just show, show, it, uh, show it all working. If you're wondering what this device is here, this is your regulator. This is what regulates the gas pressure and this will be regulated to 30 millibar and you have an on-off valve for your regulator here. You can leave that permanently open. You always want to isolate the gas at the gas bottle. And that's your test point, which is more uh, um, for dealers to test uh, for gas leaks uh, uh, at the point of habitation service. Okay then. So it's now done, we can step inside the habitation door. Just one thing to note, first they do provide a full length fly screen on your habitation door. You can't use this when it's really windy. There is a door stay which to a point will hold the door, but if the wind gets behind the door, the door will of course come round and smash and damage all of this fly screen. So you can't use this when it's really windy. Okay. Right, we can pop inside. We'll probably just start up here. Your 12 volt panel. So, common question that people ask is do we need the 12 volt panel on when we're hooked up to mains? The answer is yes you do. There's a common misconception. People think that the second you hook up to mains that everything just becomes 230 volts, which it doesn't. All of the lights, the water pumps, the TVs, they all remain 12 volt. All that's happening when you hook up to mains, you're of course powering your sockets, your, uh, the main side of your fridge, the main side of your heating, but you're also powering a charger. And that charger is simply putting more charge into your battery than the lights are taking out. Okay, so we'll start with the 12 volt panel. Um, just before I go through the workings, I'll just quickly explain. People always ask when we're hooked up to mains, do we need the 12 volt panel turned on? The answer is yes, you do. There's a common misconception. People think that when you or, uh, hook up to mains, that everything just suddenly becomes 230 volts which it doesn't. All of the lights, the water pump, the 12 volt, they all, all the TV, sorry, all remain 12 volt. All that's happening when you hook up to mains is you're powering the main side of your fridge, the heating, the uh, sockets, and also a charger. And simply the charger is putting more charge into the leisure batteries than your lights or TVs are taking out. So the, the short answer is yes, you do still need your 12 volt panel turned on for everything to work inside the vehicle. So we'll just put all that into practice. If we just have a look at the bottom left hand button here, it's quite clearly labelled 12 volts. This is the off on button for the 12 volts. The water tank levels, if you press it once, it will show you the fresh water tank is three quarters full, 75%. The grey water tank, the waste water tank is 0%, so it's empty. Just something to note, you may notice you have a picture of a tap here. This is the symbol for your water pump. Now there is actually no direct button for your water pump. What you have to do if you want to turn your water pump on and off, you have to press the water gauge symbol first and then press OK. You will now lose the tap and the water pump is now turned off. To turn it back on, again, you have to press the water tank level and then press the OK button and that will activate the pump. 
The pump works uh, by micro switch, so as you open each tap, you may be able to hear, or you won't be able to hear it on the, on the camera, on the video, but there is a small click, and that turns the pump on to pressurise the system. Um, because, of course, the tank is not a gravity-fed tank, you have to have a pressurised pump of some sort to pump the water around so you have water pressure. The picture with the battery, of course, is going to be our battery levels. Um, so uh, we will go to the uh, leisure battery is 13.4 volts and the engine battery is 12.9 volts. That's only because we're hooked up to mains. If we were to unhook, the, the battery voltages would drop to, you know, settle at around 12 and a half, something like that. The clock is, of course, the time. We've got all our 12 volt system turned on. We can talk about your Aldi uh, central heating. The Aldi is actually one unit and it will either provide hot water or it will uh, provide central heating. The central heating is, is, is provided by radiators, so it's convection heating, just like in your house. Um, you turn the heater on, it heats up, uh, the, there's a circulation pump which pumps the warm water around the radiators, and like I say, the room heats in here by convection. The system will run off of either gas or mains electric when you're hooked up to mains. Just something worth noting, gas will always heat up more quickly than mains. So if you're in a rush for hot water or heating, I would run the system off of gas first. When the, when the vehicle is up to temperature, you could then turn the gas off, flick the mains over and just retain the temperature by mains. If you have no mains available to you, then of course you can only run the system off of gas. So if we just visit this panel down here, I'm going to turn everything off. OK. So, what I would suggest you do first is decide what you'd like to run the system off of. You have your mains over here. You have one, two and three lightning rods. They are increments of a thousand watts, so, what, so a kilowatt. So one lightning rod is of course one kilowatt, two kilowatts, three kilowatts. Now, three kilowatts is quite a, a, a large drain. And if you have a few people plugged into the same mains pillar, if you start, if you, if you all of you start running heating um, on its higher setting and somebody just flicks a kettle on, then of course that might pop the trip switch on the campsite. Also, you may find if you're abroad, they tend to have a low ampage trip. And so it may not even take three kilowatts at all. So two, of course, is a happy medium and will still heat the room up and the water quite quickly and efficiently. The next setting, you need to tell the system what you'd like it to do. Do you want, and this is supposed to symbolise a radiator, central heating and hot water at the same time? Or if you flicked it right to the top, you would just have hot water only. We'll focus on the central heating and hot water because what it will do is I just want to talk about this dial here. And this is the thermostat for your central heating. You have one through to five, with five being the hottest setting. What we will now do is just run through the gas side of things. Now, my suggestion is that you run the electric and the gas alternately. Don't run them at the same time. So the switch with the gas symbol on it, if you just flick that up to gas, you don't actually get a green light for go with this system. All that happens is you get this red light illuminate just here if the system fails to ignite off of gas. Now, if it fails, it will fail within the first 30 seconds. If the vehicle has been parked up for quite a long time, that can happen. Turn it off, wait 15 to 20 seconds, and then just flick it back on again. If it continues to fail, then you need to start checking the obvious things like, is your gas bottle turned on? Um, have you run out of gas? If you've just changed a gas bottle, there may well be a bit of an airlock in the system. What you can actually do is ignite all of the hobs for 30 seconds, and that will just draw the gas through and purge the air out of the system. OK, we can turn all of that off now. You may have noticed this switch here. 
um, with labelled pump. This is the circulation pump that I was talking about for the heat exchanger. So with that pump turned on, like I say, that will uh, run warm water around the engine bay, uh, around the diesel, uh, around the diesel tank, sorry. And it will do the reverse. When the engine is running and you turn that pump on, that will run warm water around the radiators and heat the living area in here as well. So whilst we're in the kitchen area, we'll just very briefly run through the basics of the cooker. I'm sure you're familiar with these, especially if you've got a gas cooker at home. Um, to release the gas, you would turn, push and hold this. Um, and then, of course, you've got your electric igniter here. And you would, you would hold that down um, for about five to ten seconds to allow the thermocouple to heat up. Nice blue flame is what you're looking for. Uh, if you've got a bright orange flame, then, then you've got a problem. Um, normally the gas and air mixture is not quite right. And that is more often than not, um, people have a tendency of cleaning the hobs with a cream. And as the cream solidifies, then it blocks up the gas jets. And that therefore pushes out the gas and air mixture to the, the incorrect ratio. And that's why you may, may, it may be one of the causes of an orange flame. So we'd advise just uh, cleaning with it with a clear spray instead. Um, so exactly the same process for your grill, the top there, or your oven, just down there. And you have an oven light as well, which is a 12 volt light, works off your, off your laser battery. So something nice and easy. Your fridge is a three-way fridge. You can see here it will work off of gas, it will work off of mains, the battery is 12 volt. Now it's worth just mentioning that the 12 volt side of the fridge that takes a feed from the split charger on the alternator. So that does not run through your leisure battery, i.e. if you put the fridge onto 12 volt it won't flatten your leisure battery, it just won't work. Um, so that will only work whilst the engine is running on 12 volt. The nice thing is you'll see you have an auto function here and you can put the fridge onto auto and it will do everything for you. So if you park up in the middle of a field, there's no mains hookup available to you, then the fridge will select gas and will start to chill down off of gas. If you hook up to mains, it will sense that there is a main source available and it will switch over to mains for you. Or if you start the engine, then it will switch over to 12 volt and uh, will retain the temperature on 12 volt. Just worth noting with these fridges that the gas and the mains will get the fridge cold. The 12 volt just keeps it cool. It's not as powerful as the gas and the mains. So you may wish to just chill your fridge down for an hour or two before you load it up. Just another couple of things to note here. The thermostat, that being the coldest, you can of course turn the temperature down. It just depends on the outside ambient temperature really. And then there is a button here, on and off. And what that does, if I just open the freezer door, there's a, 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 a seal here and there's an element behind that seal. And that button will just heat the element. And what that will do, if you imagine, um, say you're in the south of Spain, south of France, you have a hot, humid outside air temperature here, cool, cold, dry air temperature in there. As you open and close the freezer door, condensation can form around the freezer door. And the freezer door can stick shut, or when you go to shut it, it won't shut properly. And as the ice around the door melts, then water leaks over the front of your fridge. So just flicking that button on will prevent that from happening. Um, you do have, of course, fridge catches. Just very care, just something to note, don't shut these in the locked position. Otherwise, you'll push the latch under the plastic and you'll snap the plastic latch. And then you won't be able to lock and unlock your freezer and fridge door like you can do so there. Also, there is, it's quite difficult to find, but it's just there. There is a, um, a, a setting where you can leave about a quarter inch gap with the fridge and the freezer in the locked position and that will just air the fridge and the freezer so when you're not using it it'll stop mould building up in the fridge and the freezer. Just to the left of you here, in the, we have the wardrobe, if you pop your head around here, right at the bottom of the wardrobe, you don't really need to see it but there is the Aldi unit there. Just up here, we have your solar regulator, solar controller. We have the header tank for your Aldi 
central heating fluid you'll notice there is a blue tinge that's a 50 50 fresh water and antifreeze mixture so that the radiators uh, don't get drained down in the winter so the water doesn't freeze in the radiators just to the right here we have a uh, booster box and you have a large status push-up tv aerial and we'll just push this up now and we'll just get the light on the signal find the box to read green um, we have a really good signal here in some places you go to it might be red it might be orange but you can twist the aerial through 360 degrees and push it up and push it down and that will just optimize the signal with the green light being the best signal so we can then move on to the TVs. Now there's two in this vehicle. I'll show you the one in the front lounge area because it's easier, because the second one's actually in the bedroom area. Both TVs are identical and work in the same way. So uh, for the purpose of the video, I can, I can just show you this TV for ease. The release for the TV bracket is just on the top here. You just slide that and then you can move the TV round and then we'll just turn the TV on. There is a bit of a delay with 12 volt TVs, they're low voltage so they're not as quick as the TV in your house which of course is a mains TV. So we give it a bit of time to uh, turn on, we'll just move the TV. Now this has already been pre-tuned in, uh, uh, in the workshop just for testing ready for our customer. You'll notice that with digital or free view you get an absolutely crystal clear picture or you get nothing at all, it'll say no signal. Um, it's not like the old analogue TVs where you'd get a picture in most places, but it, it was fuzzy. Um, now, what you will have to do is retune this TV every different location you go to. And you do that by holding the AQT, the orange button down. It come up with this menu. Just press OK. And then just leave it for 10 minutes. It will come up with... Uh, the programs that it either does or doesn't find DTV, digital TV, and you might get 50 to 60 free view channels. There are probably only 20 or 30 that you may want to watch. Um, right, okay. Well, so on this model, we have a fixed double bed at the back over the large rear garage. Um, you do have fold out steps here. I've folded these down, but these just simply fold back up, and there's a little latch which you can just swing down and that will just lock the steps in place and then the cupboard door latches like so. We've made up the beds at the front. You'll notice that this, in my opinion, really is a single bed. Maybe could be considered a double for, for kids possibly. Um, you have this shaped insert cushion and the table drops down. Just something worth noting when the bed is made up in the lounge area, you cannot secure, well, there's not space to secure your ladder onto here. So if you need to use the ladder to get up into the bed, then you're not going to be able to use this configuration. Um, the bed is a pull down bed. I'll just push it back up and you'll notice that we've had to fold the seats forwards in order for the bed to come all the way down. The backs of the seats are folded like so. You've just got a sprung loaded latch there and there. And then we put this back into the lounge area. We can remove this insert and then you're not going to be able to see from the camera but there are two pins that you need to pull towards you and they will raise the table up like so. The final thing we need to talk about is winterisation. So when you're finished with your motorhome for the season, as previously mentioned, this is a fully winterised vehicle, so it's ideal for using through the winter. Both tanks, the fresh and the grey tank, are housed inside, which means that with your heating on, uh, the residual heat inside the vehicle, of course, will prevent any of the water system freezing up. However, when the vehicle is parked up either in storage or on your driveway, there is no level of heat inside the vehicle. You must, of course, drain the water system down. The process is as follows. You want to make sure the water pump is turned off. You then want to open all of your taps. So your kitchen tap, your bathroom tap, your shower head, just take it off the hook, rest it on the shower tray floor just to stop any water getting caught in the hose. 
The reason you open the taps, it releases the air pressure. That way you won't trap water in the water lines. Then it doesn't matter which order you do this in, but you want to drain your fresh water tank, you want to drain your water heater, and you want to drain the water at the lowest point in the vehicle. Now, early on in the handover, you may remember on the rear off side in the garage area, just in front of your grey water tap, there were two coloured pipes, the red and the blue pipe, along with the two yellow tags. You want to lift both of those yellow tags up. The blue pipe is for the water to drain the water at the lowest point. The red pipe is to drain the water heater. The water tank drain is a bung that you physically pull out of the tank. And if we just, we've lifted this seat up for ease of, of filming, you'll see that this white tank here, this is your fresh water tank. And what you will notice is the red threaded cap, which I've already removed, has a cable attached to it. You just pull the cable out and that will pull a rubber bung out of the bottom of the tank. That's the drain for the fresh water tank. What you then want to do is nothing. Go make a cup of tea, leave the vehicle for five, ten minutes, allow gravity to do its thing. What you want to do is to wait for all of the water to drain out of the vehicle, to completely stop running out of the vehicle. When it has done so, you can then go to your 12 volt panel above your door and just flick your water pump on for 30 seconds and then turn it off again. There'll be some coughing and spluttering. What that will do is that's just going to push the last of the water out of the taps and out of the water pump. Then what you want to do is leave everything open. People tend to have a habit of going and closing all of the water, uh, all of the taps, all of the drains, but there's no need to do so. Leave everything open, just so that if there is any expansion of water inside the tap, the water will come out of the end of the tap instead of freeze inside the tap and do any damage. And then very simply, you're then uh, set for the winter, really. Uh, you can park the vehicle up and you, and you won't get any frost damage. When you want to go and do the reverse, i.e. dewinterize, you of course must close all the drain valves first, so you want to close the uh, yellow tags off in the rear garage area for both the blue uh, and the red pipe. You then want to put your bung back in to your fresh water tank and you also want to just screw your cap back in. Now you don't need to over tighten this cap but you do need to just make sure it's nipped up. There is a rubber seal there and of course if you don't tighten that up properly then when you fill your fresh water tank up you, you'll of course end up with, with a bit of a flood inside. So now we've closed all of our all of our drain points you can close all of your taps bar one. It doesn't really matter which one. Normally the easiest one to leave open is your kitchen tap and turn it to hot. You want to fill up your fresh water tank or put a capacity of water in. I suppose it doesn't have to be full, but, but, but put some water in your fresh water tank. And then you want to go and turn your water pump on, on your 12 volt panel. You will notice for nearly five minutes as the system fills, uh, the, the, the no water will come out of the end of the tap. Uh, you'll, you'll just hear it uh, gargling and, and just pushing the air out of the system. And what's happening is the pump is pulling water from your fresh water tank around through into your water heater and then eventually out through the end of the tap. And that's what takes a bit of time just to purge the air out of the system. When you start to get a steady flow of water out of your kitchen tap, move it to cold, just get all of the air out of that tap and then close that particular tap. You then want to go and open the other tap. So open your bathroom uh, sink tap and your shower tap and also your toilet flush. Just get the air out of them so you've got a steady flow of water Then you can close them up. That way you won't have uh, an airlock in the system. The system will be pressurised and ready to use, ready for the season. OK, well, thanks for watching. Uh, that's the end of our video virtual handover. Um,